Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss a book about a mid-19th century reformer, Martha Coffin Wright, who was very active in both the women's rights movement and the abolition movement. With me to discuss this book are its authors, Sherry H. Penny, a historian who for 12 years was chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and her husband, James D. Livingston, a physicist who teaches in the, depart in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I am Lawrence R. Velvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Thank you folks for coming up from Braintree to be with us today. Braintree's not that far away. Um, Sherry, why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about, preliminarily, who Martha Coffin Wright was, what role she played, when she lived, where she lived, things of that nature. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for inviting us here today to join Pleasure. you. Um, Martha Coffin Wright was born in Boston in 1806 and died in Boston in 1875, although she lived a very short part of her life in Boston. Her parents were from Nantucket, uh, Quakers, and after living in Boston for a few years, they moved to Philadelphia. And when she was only eight years old, her father died. So very early on in life, uh, she had a very important female role model in her mother, who then ran the family business and eventually changed their house into a boarding house. Well, into this boarding house came a handsome uh, man who had been in the War of 1812 named Peter Pelham. He had been wounded in the War of 1812, and he was in Philadelphia at that time to get some help for those wounds. As a boarder, Martha, now a teenager, fell in love with Peter. He was twice her age. The mother was very much opposed to this. Not only was he a non-Quaker, but he was from the South. He was a Kentuckian. She separates them for a year. But they get back together, and at age 17, Martha marries Peter Pelham. Unfortunately, it's a fairly short marriage um, because within a year and a half, he dies. In the meantime, they have had a baby, Mariana. And now Martha is a widow at age 19, and she now has to make a living to support her young child and herself. At that time, Martha moves to Aurora, New York, which is in the Finger Lakes region of New York, upstate New York, where her mother has opened a school. And Martha makes her living now by teaching, painting, and drawing, and writing. Well, lucky for Martha, there's a young aspiring lawyer that comes to Aurora, New York, named David Wright. And uh, shortly, they fall in love. And five years from the date of her first marriage, she marries David Wright. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And she will spend the rest of her life in upstate New York. David and Martha move from Aurora to Auburn, New York, where yeah. his law practice is growing. And it's really in Auburn, New York, where the reformer Martha comes out. In, her, in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, she becomes not only a devoted wife and mother of seven, but a very active reformer in the abolition movement and the women's rights movement, right. activities which she <clears throat> continues until her death in 1875. Right. And she was uh, perhaps, one might say, number four in the women's rights movement after Elizabeth Cady Stanton and... Uh, 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 Lucretia Mott and Susan B. Anthony. And Susan yes. B. Anthony, whom she called Banthony. Yeah. Yes, she called Susan B. Anthony Banthony. Uh, one of the things about Martha that was interesting is that Lucretia Mott was her sister, right. 14 right. years older. So she right. has not only a strong mother as a female role model, right. but a sister who's active in anti-slavery, who becomes right. a Quaker preacher at age right. 26. Right. So right. these are kind of the major players in the women's rights movement. Right. Elizabeth Cady Stanton who in 1847 moves to Seneca Falls, which is very close to Auburn. Right. Lucretia Mott, her sister, and they visit back and forth. Martha goes to Philadelphia, Lucretia comes to, right. to Auburn. Right. And Susan B. Anthony, whom Martha doesn't meet until 1852, but she lives in Rochester. So this right. is kind of a hotbed, right. seedbed of reform movements. Right. So right. we would like to make sure she's number four, but there are other major players <laughs> too. I mean, certainly right. Lucy Stone is a Lucy major Stone. player yeah. uh, in the movement. But, yeah. but this is the first book about Martha Coffin Wright. Right. And we're excited now her story can be told and she can take her rightful place in the reform movements. She was sort of living in the shadow of her more famous sister. Right. Right. And in a lot of books, they'll talk about sister right. of right. Lucretia Mott. Well, she has many things about her life that are very fascinating. Uh, and uh, not the least of which, Jim, is that I understand that she is an ancestor of yours. That's the most fascinating second, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. And that family connection is what first drew us to see her 
to look into her papers, which are preserved at the libraries of Smith College and uh, Syracuse University. That was our start. But as we get deeper and deeper into reading her letters and her diaries, we became more and more convinced that she was a very interesting historical figure, yeah. much beyond our family connection. Right. right. And her letters and diaries are treasure trove of information about the women's rights and abolition movements, about these leaders, just mentioned Lucretia, her sister, Elizabeth Stanton, Anthony, and also her colleagues in the anti-slavery movement, William Lloyd Garrison, right. William Henry Seward, and uh, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman. So we gradually came to realize that it wasn't just a family story we were interested in. This was a historically significant figure and that many people who were interested in reading about American history, particularly American women's history, right. would might like to learn her life story. Uh, j just as a matter of curiosity, are, are you a direct descendant in the sense that she was a great-great-great-grandmother or something like well, that? Yeah, I skipped that part, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> yeah, she's my great-great-grandmother. She's my grandmother's grandmother. Uh -huh. So that was kind of fun for me. In the book, we could yeah. sometimes yeah. we read about her describing yeah. her granddaughter, right. who That's I knew as a grandmother. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, you know, it always amazes me that maybe there's only two or three generations if you talk about the degrees of separation between us and George Washington. You know, Washington knew somebody who knew somebody who knew us. That's or right. Maybe there's one more person in there. <laughs> Shows what a young country. You can't say that about King John or Richard the Lionheart. That's right. Sherry, uh, you've mentioned Auburn, New York. Mm -hmm. Jim mentioned some of the really famous names mm -hmm. of the reform movement. Uh, of the mid-19th century. Seward, who most people probably don't know uh, who he is. William Lloyd Garrison, again, people mm -hmm. don't know who he is. Tubman, people mm -hmm. don't know who she is. Uh, why don't you explain two things? One, who each of these people are. Mm -hmm. And two, this reminds me a lot, strangely enough. Th th this may be really weird, but th there was a time in Budapest when there was a great collection of geniuses who came out of there, mm -hmm. Teller, von Neumann, mm -hmm. th three or four others whose names don't come to me mm -hmm. because I'm not a physicist. You, you would know them right <laughs> off the top of your head. A couple of them, yeah. And there was this collection of talent mm -hmm. in Budapest mm -hmm. that all worked on the Anna bomb mm -hmm. when they came to America. Mm -hmm. Western New one doesn't think of Western New York as a hotbed of reform, and yet that's what it was. So tell us how this happened mm -hmm. to occur in Western New York, Syracuse, Rochester, Auburn, Aurora, mm -hmm. Seneca Falls, and who the people were. It is very exciting to think about why did it happen there and why did it happen when it happened. So several things seem to have come together at the time. Many of the people who settled there were Quakers or were very sympathetic to the Quaker religion. And the Quakers had been more active on the East Coast, particularly in Philadelphia. But Western New York became a very interesting place for jobs and for, as we would say today, economic development. There were a lot of natural waterfalls which were very good for textile factories. New York had the foresight at the time to develop the Erie Canal, railroads. So there was natural transportation, there were natural waterways, and it was a, the fertile farmland, even though we don't think of that today, particularly for apples and pears yep. and things like that. Yep. Yep. So as some of the okay. reformers or Quakers would move there, it's apparent that they would tell others about it, and yep. more and more people began to cluster there. Yep. Now, Martha and David both ended up there because of jobs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton will move to Seneca Falls because her father has some property which he makes available to Elizabeth and her husband. So uh -huh, she, she uh -huh. comes there. Susan B. Anthony, who is very active in the women's rights movement, is in Rochester. Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, finds his way to the north, first to Massachusetts and then to Rochester, where he is founder of the North Star, a famous newspaper. William Henry Seward, who will serve New York both in the Senate and as governor of New York and then as secretary of state yep. for Abraham Lincoln, yep. Yep. has a wonderful, beautiful home, which you can now visit uh -huh. in Auburn, New York, uh -huh. not far away from the Wrights' home. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Martha Wright was very close to Francis Seward, and they would go back and forth for tea. Right. And David Wright, her husband, is a lawyer, actor, so he does some law cases with right. William Henry Seward when he's practicing law. Right. So many of these people congregate there because it's a good place for reform. It's a good place to do work, to get jobs done. And it seems to be a place where intellectual ideas flourish. Yeah. Emerson comes through to speak. Theodore Parker comes through to speak. So 
speaking and going to lectures is a big part of what one does for entertainment yeah, in Auburn, yeah, New York, yeah. where true. the winters are long. Oh, <laughs> long and terrible. <laughs> that, that when we had 90 inches in, of snow in Boston one winter, Syracuse had 250. That's right, that's right. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, and that's where the Chautauqua movement, uh, apropos of something, that's yes. where the Chautauqua movement uh, start. Why don't you just briefly tell people what the Chautauqua Yeah, the Chautauqua movement is a little later. It comes actually after Martha's time, but it, and it's, it's really further over in western New York, closer to Buffalo and Jamestown. But it was a movement for adult education. Yeah. It began as a movement to train Sunday school teachers, mm -hmm. but it really grew into an adult education movement for people to attend lectures and get the intellectual stimulation perhaps in that part of the state which wasn't New York City or Boston or Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. But it yeah. was a very exciting thing for people to have places to go to discuss and hear famous speakers. To, people read probably a lot more then than they do now. Oh, yeah. oh, Martha's yeah. letters and her diaries are sprinkled with references to literature. Right. It was probably right. a very exciting place to right. live right. in western New York at that a time. And you point out she was good friends with, with Seward's wife. Who, yes. Seward, of course, became most famous historically. Yes. It probably is not deserved because he yeah. did many other things, but uh, for, uh, as the, uh, the man uh, for whom Seward's folly was named. Exactly. That was the purchase of Alaska. That's right. Uh, but he actually. I mean, if, unless I'm mistaken, yeah. had he not been such a, uh, a radical reformer, yeah. he probably would have been president rather than Lincoln. It was only, if I remember correctly, uh, the fact that he had made so many enemies because of his uh, reform, uh, reformist leanings while in the Senate that Lincoln ended up winning exactly. the Republican nomination. That's what historians tell us. And, yeah. and we know that he was very much anti-slavery, and we know that when Martha would write about him, yeah. she would talk about his anti-slavery activities. Yeah. yeah. Well, one more thing about that area. Um, the Quaker, there was a large, as, as you've pointed out, there was mm -hmm. a large Quaker influence. Yes. Uh, I think people don't generally know these days what a, a tremendous impact yes. the Quakers had on America and on its industrialization. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, either one of you? Well, let me just start, and then Jim can pick up. The, the Quakers' religious view was that every person has with him him or her, right, right. an inner light of God. That was very important, it the her part. Very, very important, important, the yeah. her part, because this meant that nobody should dominate anybody else. Yeah. So the Quakers were very active, both in anti-slavery and abolition and in women's rights. Yeah. And they were very much also dedicated to the, to the ideals of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a religion that had a great influence at the time, and I think the people who were Quakers took it seriously as a step towards trying to do something about what they saw the evils in their society at that time, slavery and the lack of rights for women. And they were also very active in the Indian movement. Ah, uh -huh. I hadn't known that. Do uh, you have anything you want to add on that? Well, I just, just mentioned industrialization. Certainly in, in Pennsylvania, the Quakers played a major role in, in developing that state into an <clears throat> important industrial state and an agricultural state as well. Right, right. And then many of the Quakers from Pennsylvania moved up to western New York and brought with them many of these entrepreneurial skills that right, they developed right. and, and built a small... Isn't it, is, am I, do I remember correctly that the Quakers from Philadelphia fundamentally were the people who, with Benjamin Franklin, were behind a petition to the Congress in 1790 to, uh, to uh, enact a law freeing the slaves, which the Congress uh, buried lest it rip the country apart. So they had a long history of being uh, abolitionists, if, if my memory is correct. Yeah, the Quakers, in fact, uh, maybe with a few exceptions, had, uh, by the end of the 18th century, had given up their own slaves and uh -huh. had made institutional statements against slavery. So certainly by the 1790s, the Quakers were in the forefront yeah. of anti-slavery movement, movements. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have there been, in your judgments, uh, one of the things that interests me so much about the book mm -hmm. uh, and the article you wrote that is going yeah. to be uh, printed in uh, the New England, New England Journal of Public Policy, New England Journal of Public Policy, mm -hmm. is that it's so clear that you believe there is, there have been many historical analogies mm -hmm. afterwards uh, to uh, to what you write about, although you carefully, I gather don't uh, specifically talk about the historical analysis. There's just an illusion here or mm -hmm. there, and one kind of gets the idea, oh, yeah, well, isn't this like this, or isn't this mm -hmm. like that, and so on and so forth. Um, speaking of the geography and the collection of reformers mm -hmm. in one place, 
Has there, in your opinion, ever been another area in American, uh, in, in the United States, mm -hmm. over history where you had a similar collection of reformers in one place? Well, this is pushing it a bit, because we talked about this as we thought about uh, writing the article. Certainly in the 1960s, you had a lot of reform, anti-war, women's rights, civil rights on both coasts around in the Berkeley, Stanford yeah, area, yeah. California, the Yale, Harvard, Columbia area on the East Coast. One of whose was, was named William Sloan Coffin, by the way, right? Yes. Exactly. Which yes. might be a descendant, but go yeah. ahead, I'm sorry. Was a, was a minister, that's yes. right. So it, it's, it, it's maybe it's pushing it a little bit, but there certainly are a lot of parallels between the things that the reformers of the 1830s and 40s fought for and what happened again in the 1960s. Yeah. A lot yeah. of interesting parallels there in terms of the progress that was made or wasn't made in the 1840s that had to be yeah, resurfaced yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sherry, before we move on to some other subjects, why don't you d describe uh, for us a little bit, because I, per I personally think it's fantastic, what were the parallels between the 1840s and 1850s and uh, what remained the unfinished business which was partly taken care of in the 1960s but which Again, perhaps there are counter parallels in the Gilded Age of the 1870s, 1880s, and 90s, and what happened in the 1980s, 90s, and 1990s in this country. What were some of the parallels in each direction? Well, if I just look at the women's rights movement as an example, the first women's rights convention is held in 1848. Women don't get the right to vote until 1920. That's a long time. Um, and what of the women at that convention did vote? Yeah. In 1920. Yes. Yeah. Um, 1848 to 1923, an equal rights amendment for women is proposed, which has yet to be realized. 1848 to 1963, equal wages for women are guaranteed in legislation. 1848 to 1964, no more discrimination in employment against women. Now, the one that troubles me the greatest, 1848 to 1972 before equal rights to women were guaranteed in higher education. We know Title IX primarily through athletics. And Harvard's just getting around to it. Yes. <laughs> another, another show, Larry, that's yeah, right. I know. I mean, because we know about the women's soccer team in the Olympics. But until 1972, women could be discriminated against in admissions, financial aid, athletics, the whole range of things in higher education. So if Martha were to look at this today, she would say, well, I'm glad to see the progress, but why did it take so, so long. long? And one could also, of course, uh, make the same kinds of statements about the 1840s and 50s and the 1960s and thereafterwards on another subject of great concern to her, abolition Absolutely. and the rights of blacks. Civil rights. Yeah. The civil rights movement, which again, it wasn't until the 1960s that you get civil rights legislation. Right. So although obviously the slaves were freed, yeah. Certainly, it took a long, long time for them to be anywhere near equal rights. Yeah. And we could yeah. have another discussion about whether women and people of color have equal rights today. Uh, I understand. You know, I'll tell you just one little thing before uh, uh, I'll ask you another question about the Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, there was a period of my life where I was a constitutional lawyer. And uh, the Supreme Court started talking in the 60s or 70s mm -hmm. about something called a badge of slavery meaning that you kept people down, they couldn't get jobs, mm -hmm. they couldn't get decent housing, so, and this was called a badge of mm -hmm. slavery. I really didn't understand that until I began reading the history of the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, mm -hmm. and 1880s, and learned how the South, and then the North too, kept doing unto these people exactly what had been done unto them in slavery, right. so they might as well have continued being slaves right. for all That's practical right. purposes. That's right. That's right. Uh, before we go to the break, talk just a little bit about the ant counter reform movements, mm -hmm. the Gilded Age in the mm -hmm. late 1800s, and the period from roughly 1972 or three up until, I suppose one could say today, mm -hmm. in our own lifetimes. Yes, what, what hap when you read about a reform movement, you usually see a lot of reform takes place, and then there is a period of calm. <laughs> or sometimes you go backwards in this period. But after the great movements of the 1830s and 40s and 50s, and then the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed, you did move into the Gilded Age, uh, an age of American business and over -ex excessive practices late in the 1890s. If you want to take the parallel to the 20th century again, the reforms of the, 18, the 1960s yeah. in both women's rights and rights for blacks, 
we then entered an age again of big business, yep. and we're now maybe begin to come into a corrective. But the Enron area, the WorldCom, the Enron, when these corporations have pushed the limits, yep. and I yep. want to be yep. fair to say that out of the 3,000 and some corporations, maybe you have 20 or 25 that have right. been challenged, right. but it was an, it's again an age of excess. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, maybe those are all that have been challenged, but God knows, you know, we're finding out that ones that aren't challenged, AIG has been coming up. Who, who, who would have right. thunk it about who AIG? Who would have thought that? Xerox. Uh, That's yeah. Right. Uh, okay, when we come back, we'll be, we will discuss uh, the, uh, more than you have done already. You've done some of it already. Yeah. The factors in the background of Martha Wright's life, which led her to become what Martha Coffin Wright did become in, uh, starting in the 1840s. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a short announcement. They came from every corner of the country, from small towns and big cities. But they all shared one thing in common. They belonged to a family called Marines. A tough and determined few dedicated to protecting everything we hold sacred. And still, they come. Celebrate the 225-year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. This is the story about a group of kids who volunteer. Do something nice for someone. We fixed stuff. Did some art projects with the kids. We fixed up this house. We worked in the woods. Cleaned up the park. Did something for the planet. We just did it. No other reason. And you know what? It was great. At first, they didn't know each other. Well, that didn't last long. This guy is really funny. We ace are my new friends. Are you into it? Call 4-H or check out our website at areyouintoit.com. Kids aren't afraid of other kids. Or people with different color skin. That's because kids know there are other things. Worse things. Bigger things to be afraid of. Like monsters from outer space! Remember, friends come in all colors. Before you know it, she talks. Before you know it, she walks. Before you know it, she knows you. Before you know it, she has a heart. Before you know you're pregnant, when your baby's no bigger than a grain of rice. Before she's a twinkle in your eye, that's when you need to take folic acid every day. After that, it's too late to prevent some serious birth defects. Folic acid now, before you know it. Welcome back. Before we actually discuss the background factors that moved Martha Coffin Wright to do what she did, Sherry, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about two things. Why her neighbors considered her, considered her quote, a very dangerous woman, unquote, and uh, how the uh, first con women's rights convention which was held at Seneca Falls, of all places. <laughs> now, this was not held in New York. It was not held in San Francisco. Right. It was held in Seneca Falls. There was no San Francisco then. Uh, how it came about. But we'll start with the very dangerous women okay. because it's a very interesting story that Jim and I found in the correspondence. Martha Wright, as we've mentioned, was very active in women's rights and abolition. She became a friend of Frederick Douglass, the famous uh, escaped slave abolitionist, in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention. And after that time, he frequently was a guest in Auburn to speak. He was one of the speakers. Right. And because it was what it was at that period of time, he was not allowed to eat in the restaurants or stay in any of the hotels there. Yep. So he frequently stayed with the Wrights in their home and had dinner with them. And her neighbors would sometimes say, well, when he's there, do you give him a seat at the table? Do you allow him to have the best bedroom? 
and she answered to one neighbor one day, when dealing with a man of superior intellect, one does not notice whether he's black or white. And of course, he sits at the table and has the best room. Can so I, can I interject yes. something? In other sh books I've read and had shows on, it has come up that this eating dinner at the same table mm -hmm. was an enormous thing in the yeah. South. That's what they couldn't believe above all else. Yes. For some reason, the act of breaking bread. Yes. Today, TV dinner, you rush off. But That's in those right. days, it meant a lot more, and so this was a phenomenal thing, but go ahead. So, you know, he ate dinner with them. In fact, there's one very cute letter when uh, Martha and Frederick Douglass are working on something, and she hands him her baby Charlie and said, would you hold Charlie for me while I do this? So he was really very close to them, and so her neighbors began to call her a very dangerous woman, partly because of her effort to change society and her efforts with people of, of the black race. Now, Seneca Falls is a little bit longer story, and we have to start back in the year 1840. In 1840, there was the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, and a very few American women were sent there as delegates. One of them was Lucretia Mott, Martha's sister. Another person who attended this conference was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, not as a delegate, but with her husband, who was a delegate. When the women got there, they were refused admission to the conference. They said, women, we will allow you to sit behind a curtain and hear the proceedings, but you cannot be part of the conference. Sounds we are like not allowing Orthodox women Jewish in synagogue here. to me. <laughs> so there they were. So the story is that Lucretia and Elizabeth Cady Stanton go for a walk and protest this and say, when we get back to the United States, we're going to hold a women's rights convention. This is 1840. Yeah. Yeah. In the summer of 1848, Lucretia Mott is visiting her sister, Martha Coffin Wright, in Auburn. Elizabeth Cady Stanton has just moved to Seneca Falls in 1847. Yeah. Yeah. Jane Hunt, who was a Quaker, has a tea party at her home and invites Elizabeth Cady Stanton, invites Marianne McClintock, who's another Quaker, invites Martha Wright and her sister, Lucretia Mott. Yeah. The five women sit down for tea in early July, and at that tea party, they planned the first ever women's rights convention yeah. to take place July 19 and 20th in Seneca Falls, which is Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home. Yeah, yeah. It took eight years from the time that they were at that convention in London. Yes. Till you, you got enough of a, what, what do they call it, a core group, a, a sufficient nuclear core Nucleus. group? You have a yeah. core group, and you yeah. also had the occasion for Lucretia visiting Martha. Things just kind of came together. Yeah. And yeah. when they sat in that meeting, they planned the first ever women's rights convention. They yeah. list their grievances. Right. They decide to paraphrase the Declaration of Independence, that all men and women are created equal. Right. And right. they put a call in the newspaper right. to say we're having a women's rights convention. All are invited, and the famous Lucretia Mott will speak. Right, because by that time, her sister had become, uh, and of course, that would be your great, 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 Aunt. Aunt. <laughs> yeah, but she certainly by then was one of the most famous women in America. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the books I think was t about her was t titled "The Greatest Woman in America." So she was certainly uh, a, f a celebrity draw to yeah. the audience. Yeah. Today it'd be Britney Spears. I mean, we, <laughs> this is anti-Darwinian. I mean, so who said in, in about 1900 that when you consider that it once was Adams, Jefferson, and Washington, and in 1900 it is whoever it was, it proves that Darwin was wrong. <laughs> that could be. That Evolution could be. is noise positive. That could be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, now, actually, uh, Coffin Wright went to also to the first American anti-slavery yes. uh, society meeting in 1833, didn't That's she? That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's a strange business. Now, what are some of the things, well, before we get into that, after 18, uh, number one, the reaction in 1840, yeah. was dramatic, they had 300 people or something at yes. that first convention. That's right. That's right. And after that, you had, with the possible exception of one year, a convention a year until the Civil War, didn't you? That's right. You, there, right after the Seneca Falls Convention, there was a follow-up convention held in Rochester which Martha didn't attend because of her pregnancy. When Seneca Falls occurred, Martha was six months pregnant with her seventh child. So although she attended, uh, she writes in her correspondence that she was tried to shrink and not be too visible at the convention yeah. as much as shrinking was possible. Yeah. We might want to mention the, the statue here. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. In yeah. 1980, when the second <clears throat> wave of the women's movement uh, became to be more prominent and women's history became more interesting to many people, the Congress passed the 
the, a law founding the Women's Rights National Historical Park at Seneca Falls. Right. And now if you go there in the visitors hall, you'll find a collection of life-size bronze statues. And one of these, in fact, is Martha Wright, showing her visibly pregnant. Right, right. Uh, and we the book is that, uh, and you talked about mm -hmm. this early on, is that the Martha Wright was not merely a reformer. Susan B. Anthony, one might say, quote, is, was, quote, merely, unquote, a reformer. Mm -hmm. that, she spent her whole life doing that. Martha Wright had seven kids. She had grandchildren. Mm -hmm. She took care of the house. She cooked. She sewed. She cleaned. Uh, she, she helped her daughters when they were having uh, their children. I mean, this was a woman who, in the modern, uh, in the modern uh, parlance, uh, did it all. She did it all. That's it was right. quite, quite remarkable, That's really. Right. Which is another reason why the story of Martha Wright is still true today, isn't it? Yes. The, the, the issues that Martha Wright wrestled with, how to balance work and family, are still evident today. As you said, she spent many of her days cooking, cleaning, sweeping, taking care of the children, getting, stopping fights between her little boys. I mean, she talks a lot about this in her letters. In a very honest way, right. the thing that we found most interesting in Martha's letters is how honest it, she is yeah. about the drudgery of housework and how she resents every minute she has to spend <laughs> yeah. on it. Over and over yeah. again, she'll talk about that. There's, there's one letter where uh, she gets a sewing machine, and she says, it's so wonderful to have a sewing machine. I wish I could get a cleaning machine now. Yeah. So yeah. she doesn't like it, and she's very yeah. honest about yeah. that. Yeah. And she's honest about how difficult it is to raise children. Yeah. She, in one funny letter, she's, she remembers a picture of Christ in the church, and she said, I wonder if his mother had to get up with him <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> So she's just really honest about, about how she father. feels about all these things. And much of this comes yeah. out in something she wrote called Hints for Wives. Uh -huh. it, was, uh -huh. it, was, it was published in 1846, and it was actually read at Seneca Falls, where she outlines the drudgery of a housewife, how difficult this job is. And she predates Betty Friedan in many yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah, you have made the comment. Well, we'll get to it later, because yeah. I, I want to get back to what I said we were going to get yeah. to, which is, why don't you briefly, uh, or whatever length you want, yeah. really, uh, talk about uh, the, the uh, background characteristics okay. and influences on her life, her religion mm -hmm. uh, and her mother, to start with two, her religion and her yeah. mother. What was the effect upon, uh, on, on her life of those two factors? Yes, Martha, uh, we don't think, became a women's rights advocate by accident. Uh, her Quaker religion was very important to her, and as we said earlier, this was the belief that every person has within him or herself a, the light of God and that no one should dominate anyone else. Now, one of the parts of her story which is interesting is that when she married Peter Pelham, she was expelled from the Quaker church. Yeah. Yeah. So she yeah. f officially wasn't a Quaker, but she had been raised as a Quaker and she had Quaker beliefs. So that was number one. Number two was the influence of these strong female role models. Yeah. A mother who ran her own business, when the father died, they had a lot of debt. The mother ran the own, her own business successfully to eliminate the debt and open a boarding school. Strong mother in, as a female role model. Sister as a strong female role model. Her friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, another female role model. So really, three things came together in Martha. The, the Quaker religion, the family influence of, of strong women, and her own personal experience of being a wife and mother, which in a sense she would say, this is more than anybody really bargains for. Yeah, yeah. And she wistfully writes about wanting more time to read. In this era, yeah. she would have been a writer or a journalist because right. she wrote even then for the nation, for the revolution, for the North Star. Mm -hmm. But she, she's frustrated that so much of her time and energy is taken out on what she calls the treadmill tasks. Right not allowing right. her enough time for the intellectual part of her. Right. And the nation, I might say, was the very same, the nation, which exists today. That's right. It's always been uh, a reformist, uh, leftist, call it what you yes. will, uh, kind, of, kind of magazine. Uh, did she have experiences with ex-slaves when she was younger? Yes, she had a couple of interesting experiences. When they lived in Aurora, there was a, a neighbor who had um, an ex-slave in her home, and Martha saw the scars on the back of this woman from slavery. And then when she attended the anti-slavery convention in 1833 with Lucretia, she met many freed blacks. So she had acquaintances early on in her life yeah. that also, I think, influenced her in her anti-slavery yeah. views. And then, of course, she became a very close friend of Frederick Douglass. Right. Uh, 
One, one last point about the background. Did the, in 1848, there were a number of revolutions in Europe. Yes. And in fact, in your book, you, I think it is, you, you point out that uh, the, one of the Hungarian revolutionists, Louis Kossuth, mm -hmm. uh, was in western New York making uh, speeches. Yes. Uh, did the revolutions of 1848 have any effect on either Martha Coffin Wright or the other reformers who were in favor of abolition or in favor of women's rights? Well, I doubt if there was a cause and effect relationship exactly, but <clears throat> I think both in Europe and the United States there was still some of this spirit of freedom that was generated by the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and certainly Martha related to the stories of the European revolutions. It was another and like Kossuth, and supporting rebellion against established authority, mm -hmm. which is what she was doing in the abolition movement, which was what she was doing in women's rights, and then supported, certainly, Kossuth and the other revolutionaries in Europe. But there was never, I think, any real direct connection. I mean, I don't, I don't think they went to Seneca Falls because of the yeah. Hungarian Revolution. Yeah. But uh, Yeah. Would this be a case of what in the sciences are called parallel invention, you know, different people <laughs> coming? to the yeah. same conclusions because they live in the same mm -hmm. time period of history, but doing it independently. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, it was a time to shed the old ways and try some new yeah. ones that give us more freedom. Yeah. The, in what ways exactly, Sherry, do you think that, uh, that she antedated uh, Betty Friedan? Or what did Betty Friedan <laughs> say that was pretty much the same as what Martha Coffin Wright yeah. said? When, when Betty Friedan wrote her book in 1963, it was called The, the, the Problem That Has No Name. And in a sense, that's really what Martha Coffin Wright writes about in Hints for Wives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as we found out, as she was willing to write about it in a very articulate and humorous way. This is a humorous article, too. Mm -hmm, but it's very mm -hmm. clear that she is seeing the problem of doing the treadmill task, as she said, washing the same faces, making the same beds, sewing the innumerable garments. And then she writes, it's the wife who has to get up in the middle of the night when the children cry. The husband gets a wonderful night's sleep so he can awake refreshed and go to work. So when you read the whole selection of Hints for Wives, which, which is in the book, yeah. you say, my goodness, it sounds a lot like something we read yeah. in the 1960s yeah. Yeah. when women again were home and they weren't ha finding ways to use their intellectual capacities, yeah. which part of, was a great part of what Betty Friedan will talk about. Yeah. Just as a matter of my personal curiosity, uh, is it possible that Martha Wright essentially was presenting the world as seen, th because she would contrast the, uh, the uh, diverse life of men in business mm -hmm. and in law. Mm -hmm. And I is it possible that she was representing the world through the eyes of <clears throat> the middle class wife of those yeah. days, as opposed to, say, uh, the agricultural worker or the or the factory worker of those days who may although they were their lives were pretty much continuous yeah. drudgery mm -hmm. yes I mean, in her article again she refers to the husband going to work in the ever varying chores of the business life but if many husbands went out to the non varying jobs of digging yeah. ditches or, <laughs> or yeah. hoeing the cornfield so certainly to her view was a represent of the upper middle class woman that she was. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, most of the women's movement was uh, taken, the, the, most of the participants were members of the upper middle class and not the, not the lower classes yeah. or the working yeah. classes. Yeah. We heard, I mean, I mean, wasn't there a reprise more or less of that kind of situation and implicit criticism? in say the 60s and the 70s right up until today mm -hmm. in that the reform movements are fundamentally it is often claimed uh, movements of the uh, uh, upper meritocracy in New York and San Francisco and <laughs> elsewhere yeah. not movements of the heartland of America. Well there's certainly some parallels yes. Yeah, particularly... Uh, go ahead. ahead. No go on. No I'm just saying the heartland of America I mean obviously you also have the question of the importance of the basic religious beliefs that in this case, modern times at least, are controlling how reform-minded the people are. And, uh, yes. With yes. the church, in many cases, representing tradition yeah. and reformers challenging yeah. tradition. Yeah. That is the exact subject I want to get into when we come back from uh, our next and last break. So we will discuss the uh, role of the church mm -hmm. in reform and in anti-reform uh, in Martha Wright's day and in our own day. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you. 
are not just words. These are our core values. Values by which each and every member of the Air Force Reserve lives. So whether we are deploying humanitarian aid or providing natural disaster relief or defending freedom wherever it's threatened, the men and women of the Air Force Reserve are there, protecting our values and serving our country. Air Force Reserve, above and beyond. There is strength in our numbers. Our call is to action, to practice what we preach, be there to care. Our passion is compassion. We're only human, but together we're humane. Our letters stand for taking a stand, for taking the lead, for filling the need. The American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Be part of our heart. Exercise your emotions. Attend a live orchestra concert. Go to findaconcert.com. Welcome back. Tell us a little bit about Martha Wright's rejection, really of all religion, I gather, the reasons for it, and what the stands of the organized churches of America were in those days with regard to women's rights and with regard to slavery. Well, the slavery was more of a mixed story. Certainly the churches in the South were very defensive. In fact, were claiming that slavery was supported by the Bible and Jesus wanted slavery. But they had to reach, but they could often find quotations sure. that to them gener demonstrated that God supported slavery. Right. Uh, Churches in the North was more of a mixed bag. Uh, some chose to ignore the subject because it was, it was a delicate thing and they didn't want to offend some of the congregation. Certainly in, in Auburn, in fact, uh, a couple of the churches that Martha and David Wright quit was because the congregation was angered by some minister making pro-slavery, pardon me, pardon me, uh, anti-slavery statements. And one minister asked after, in 59, asking them to pray for John Brown, yeah. which was very controversial, yeah. and the congregation voted him out. Right. And that's when the right was the last time they were members of an organized church. Uh, Martha, of course, started off with experience of being expelled from the Quakers, <laughs> relatively liberal uh, church, but nevertheless for marrying a non-Quaker. And then when she learned with the uh, women's movement particularly, the, the the churches were continually, and the, the pulpits were full of quotes from St. Paul and from Genesis and the Old Testament about women should stay in their place, you should be subservient to your husband, just as we are all subservient to God, you should be subservient to your husband. So certainly, she, this developed more of an antagonism towards the official churches. They did attend, well certainly her husband attended church quite frequently at, in, in Auburn until they got angry about this uh, John Brown incident. and. Uh, but Martha, I think, had, although she believed in a merciful God and she respected the life of, of Jesus, she was, did not like to have some organizations telling her what to do. She yeah. once quoted saying, um, the ideas that you hear from the pulpit and the Bible are no better or worse than our ideas. They come from fallible mortals like ourselves, and they may even be less reasonable if they seem less rational. Yeah. So she was very much an independent thinker. You might call her a free thinker, but she was definitely yeah. Christian. Yeah. People in my generation, Jim, uh, we're all the same generation, really. <laughs> Roughly. <laughs> Roughly, yeah. Tend to think of religion uh, as being uh, fundamentally a reformist organizing force because we lived through the civil rights revolution mm -hmm. when the churches, by and large, by and large, uh, were in favor of reform, 
and of course priests and uh, ministers and rabbis uh, went down south. Uh, and uh, we know that in the north in the 1850s, uh, the churches became, many of them became uh, pro-reform, even though not all did, and even though the southern churches stood four square for slavery. You know, but it's not really true, is it, that the church in this country has most of the time been an agent of reform? If anything, isn't it true that most of the time the churches have stood for conser uh, political conservatism? Well, you, it's certainly a balance, it, 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 but I think the churches tend to stand for tradition, and uh, they feel many of these changes threaten, like, of course, today the, the, uh, the gay marriage or abortion or stem cell research, things that they consider threats to biblical teaching, particularly the groups that believe in literal believing of the Word of God in the Bible. So uh, I think you find even today churches that are very progressive and churches that are quite yeah. yeah. anti-progressive, I yeah. guess you'd call them. Yeah. Yeah, we're certainly seeing a lot of that from organized religion. It would, with regard, as you point out, to stem cell research and uh, evolution and, uh, and, and some other matters now. Um, in Martha Wright's day, it was qu often quite dangerous to be a reformer. Mm -hmm. uh, conventions had to be guarded by police, mm -hmm. by mayor. The story about the mayor who kept the, who was just sitting on the stage with the you know, gun, loaded gun in hand. This question of danger, or this uh, point about danger to reformers, this is a pretty much a constant refrain throughout American history, is it not? That's right. Well, certainly in the 60s, again, if you were down in the South working for the voting rights for blacks, mm -hmm. uh, many of them either lost their lives or were uh, severely beaten. And uh, when you're going against the established rules of the current status quo, yeah. you often threaten the authorities and the authorities often come back and teach yeah. you a lesson. Yes. This uh, just the other day there was in the paper a story about the uh, this must be about the 75th roughly or 70th uh, anniversary of what in effect was a small war in West Virginia where federal ultimately federal troops and state guardsmen and so forth uh, and, and about 5,000 workers fought pitched battles mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was a lot of that labor strife in Detroit and so mm -hmm. on. And today we're getting, uh, you know, it, it, it's not so safe necessarily to be an abortion doctor today. It hasn't been in the 90s. It's so true. It's true. one gets this uh, over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, what was Martha Wright's attitude? I mean, she started out as a Quaker. Mm -hmm. Quakers are famous for pacifism. Mm -hmm. Viz Richard Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> Who managed to Irony. overcome that? <laughs> <laughs> what was Martha's right reaction to two things, John Brown and the Civil War? Well, I think first this came up in the, the bleeding Kansas uh, prior to the Civil War, and the Kansas was going to have the, the popular sovereignty and decide whether to go slave or free, and it was quite a bit of violence. Yep. Uh, Pro-slavery, anti-slavery moving into Kansas, and a raid on Lawrence, Kansas, and then John Brown, in fact, involved with a, a massacre against the, the pro-slavery forces. Martha, at one, one case, was writing to her minister saying, uh, you know, yes, she knows that to stick to Jesus' rules, non-resistance, non-violence is the way to go as a true Christian. But she was questioning whether either the minister or she would really be able to do that if they were in a situation like this. Sometimes the cause that you're fighting for may be more important than this violence issue. So certainly again, when it came to the Civil War, of course, when her son was in the Union Army, Near the end of the war, she got so angry at the South, particularly for killing, for wounding her son, that she ended up saying she would rather have the South depopulated than have the war end before the abolition of slavery. She almost got bloodthirsty by the end of the war, yeah. which yeah. was quite a switch from non-resistance, yeah. Quaker pacifism, yeah. and developing the hostility to the, to the South over the slavery yeah. issue. Yeah, what she talked about was not not so dissimilar, in my judgment, from the Morgenthau plan for Germany after World mm -hmm. War II, which was to turn Germany into an agrarian mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was her opinion? Yeah, I have to say that uh, uh, the New Englanders uh, sent rifles to the abolitionists uh, in Kansas. They, were, they packed them in, uh, in, in wooden uh, 
crates, and they called them Beecher's Bibles. Henry Ward Beecher sent them. <laughs> yeah, called, that's right. They called these Sharps rifles, uh, breech loading rifles, Shar uh, Beecher's Bibles. What was her reaction to John Brown? I asked her for this question. John Brown has come down in history mm -hmm. as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Not so dissimilar from the suicide bombers of today or to uh, you know, the Irgun uh, or the, the, the Stern Gang in Israel mm -hmm. or uh, the Irish Revolutionists of 1916 or a host of others that you can mm -hmm. name. Uh, he is regarded as a terrorist, but, uh, but uh, when he died, bells pealed in the north, which just frightened the south to death. Mm -hmm. uh, what was her, because uh, the north, he, he, he made himself into a, sure. a, a martyr. A martyr. Mm -hmm. And in fact, his uh, last speech, which was actually not a speech, is a written thing about, uh, you know, I, John Statement Brown, now there. declare mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the sins of this guilty nation mm -hmm. will not be purged but by blood and so on. That's right. Very moving, very moving stuff. Insightful. Yes, and very insightful. Mm -hmm. What was her reaction to John Brown? Well, we, we haven't found a particular letter where she's spelled out in detail, but it's pretty clear from inference that she was supportive of what John Brown was trying to do, but maybe not necessarily fully supportive of the method that he used. But it is interesting, we did find that her daughter, Ellen, had a picture of John Brown in her room. So <laughs> apparently her daughter had picked up from her mother that John Brown was actually someone to admire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But clearly the question of, she was torn still between this violence issue versus slavery and uh, even the, you know, William Lloyd Garrison and other abolitionists too. The strange irony that the abolitionists who, many of whom were pacifists, yeah. non-resistances, yeah. yeah. brought about in, in, or at least helped to contribute to the, one of the bloodiest wars in history. Oh yeah, so oh yeah. The, the irony of uh, pacifists leading to a war. Yeah. And certainly in Kate Martha's case, as we say, she sort of moved from pure pacifism to a, well, maybe sometimes pacifism to almost yeah. bloodthirsty. But yeah. well, uh, uh, her son, as you mentioned, uh, suffered a really awful wound. When you just, mm. when I read the description of the wound in your book, uh, particularly given the medicine of those days, the fact that he recovered is some kind of miracle. I mean, mm. God must, that must have been the hand of God. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it went in and it ripped up things and it went up and out, oh my. Uh, but he was, uh, he was at uh, the high water mark of the high tide, double canister at 10 yards when he got wounded. T tell us about that. Yeah, it was Martha's son, <clears throat> Willie Wright, who was a, a, an artillery officer in the Union Army. He went through many of the important battles or big battles of the war, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville. But the most famous battle of, of, of all is the Battle of Gettysburg, the most famous part of Battle of Gettysburg, of July 3rd, 1863, Pickett's Charge. And he was among the Union soldiers on the peak of Cemetery Ridge, uh, defending and in fact shooting at all these 14,000 Confederate soldiers coming up the hill, well, modest hill. And uh, at the peak of Pickett's Charge, as they broke through uh, the line there, some of the soldiers broke through the line, one of the Confederates put a bullet through Willie's chest, right through his lung and the back. But just uh, before that, Willie and his team of artillery men had loaded the cannon with double canister. The canister being little metal cylinders that contain many small pellets. And when they're fired from a cannon, it's like a giant shotgun. And they were all loaded, all these five cannon were loaded. And just as the Confederate soldiers came for them, yelling, take the guns, take the guns, uh, they were no more than 10 yards away when the order to fire came. And of course, there were no more Confederates standing after those yeah. five cannons fired. And so the, the monument on high water mark at Gettysburg, where this occurred and where Willie was wounded, uh, has a, just says double canister at yeah, 10, 10 yards. yards yeah. I think there was also a, a lieutenant or a captain named Cushing who fell over dead after they fired the charge. And now, Cushing was in the, in the adjacent. Um, in the adjacent? Adjacent battery. Adjacent battery. Yeah. yeah. The Confederates actually took Cushing's battery, but they did not quite take yeah. Rice battery. Yeah. Rice battery was able to fire before yeah. they yeah. captured them. <clears throat> and that, of course, is regarded as the high tide of the Confederacy. That's, that's After that, right. it was a receding wave. That's so right. the story goes, and probably took, took right a while, there. but it was it was yeah. receding. Right. Yeah. yeah, that and Vicksburg, this very same, that's very right. same week, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of days in July of 1863. Uh, with Quaker pacifism in any way a forerunner? ideas we've seen in our own day and slightly before our own day, uh, Gandhian 
civil disobedience and uh, Martin Luther King civil disobedience? Well, certainly the, the basic idea of confronting problems with a nonviolent approach, but obviously in the case of the Civil War, it didn't quite end up yeah. non, mm -hmm. nonviolent. But I think Gandhi and King, although certainly there was some violence in the South, they did achieve a lot. I think Gandhi in particular, but certainly the Civil Rights Movement did achieve a lot of progress without as much bloodshed as the abolition yeah. movement did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I gather Quaker pacifism, too, did not have as one of its tenets the way King and Gandhi did uh, uh, civil disobedience. It was more a case of suasion to the Quaker. It's more suasion, yes. Yeah. But it could, it, it could be dramatic because although he wasn't a Quaker, William Lloyd Garrison was often burned the Constitution yes. on the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. to, yes. Because, you know, he supported the Declaration of Independence, but not the Constitution, yeah. which implicitly yeah. Uh, supported slavery. Yeah. Called it in a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. That was on the first yes. on the, on the, of the Liberator, his newspaper. In the two minutes or so that remain to us, tell us a little bit, or as much as you can say in two minutes, <laughs> about what happened after the Civil War when the question was, shall black Americans have the vote? Shall female ha Americans have the vote? Shall both get the vote? And who stood where on this question and why? It's really interesting that the women's movement and abolition were so intertwined then as, as in later in the 60s. After the Civil War, the women's movement split. There were a group of women who were willing to say, we'll get the vote for blacks first in the 15th Amendment. We are willing to wait for our rights for women to vote. And they were pretty much led by Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell. The other camp was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martha Coffin Wright, Susan B. Anthony, um, this group of women really felt that they had to have a 15th and a 16th Amendment. Women had to have the right to vote now. Now, interesting. Excuse me, those are the 15th and 16th Amendments as presented then, not the ultimate 15th and 16th exactly. Amendments that we exactly. think Exactly. They of wanted today. a 15th Amendment for the black yeah. vote and a 16th Amendment for the women's vote. Yeah. Uh, what happens, of course, the women's movement splits then, but one of the roles that Martha plays up until a few days before her death is to try to bring those two women's votes, those two women movements back together. Just before her death, she writes to Lucy Stone and says, can't we as of old get back together? T tell me, Sherry, because we have about 30 seconds yeah. left. Why were some women willing to, uh, and maybe even think it desirable for black Americans mm -hmm. to get the vote first and then the women's, and why did the others object to anything but a fusion of the two? The ones that objected felt that they, if they waited, they'd wait a long time, and of course they were right. The, the women who believed it would be okay to, get, to wait for women thought they could trust the Republicans that they would really help them to get the vote. The others felt if we don't get it now, it won't yeah, happen, yeah, yeah. and clearly they were right. And, and the ones who were willing to wait and who trusted the Republicans, wrongly as it turned out, uh, felt that uh, we ought to do it this step by step in order to avoid huge uh, opposition. Opposition, that's yeah. right. The more things change, the more they remain the same. So they waited until 1920. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Mm -hmm. I'm, getting, I'm getting frantic calls to end to uh, say that the program is over. Okay. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting thank us. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. To the audience, be with us again next time.